You're listening to Indiana Jones and the Comics Crusade on the Longbox Crusade Network. Hello and welcome to Indiana Jones and the Comics Crusade. I'm your host, Jared Albrecht, the Yard Sale Artist, and I will be taking you on an adventure with me as I index all 34 issues of 1983's The Further Adventures of Indiana Jones by Marvel Comics. On this episode, we will be taking a look at issue number four. Issue four was cover dated April of 1983. Its script is by David Michelini. Penciler is Ron Friends. Inks is Danny Bulanati. Letterer is Joe Rosen. Colorist Bob Sharon and editor is Louise Jones. Here's the cover description. The cover is drawn by Ron Friends and inked by Danny Bulanati. The Marvel Comics Group banner is orange with black letters, and Indiana Jones stands pistol ready in his orange corner box. The title logo is white with orange highlights, and the main action depicts Indiana Jones caught in quite the pickle. Indy is on some subway tracks using his iconic whip to protect the lovely Karen Mays from the Nazis that are rushing them in the foreground. But it's double the danger because the subway train is barreling down on them from behind. And now for a quick story synopsis. Indiana Jones is on the way to England to help some archaeologists there make sense of a new crystal they found during a freak accident at Stonehenge. But our favorite adventurer hasn't even made it across the Atlantic yet when his charter pilot reveals that he's a Nazi and leaves Indy stranded in a crashing plane. As usual, Indy uses his quick wits and a bit of luck to make it out alive. Once he gets to England, he links up with fellow researcher Karen Mays and begins working on deciphering the crystal. And they are successful, but the Germans have ears everywhere and are hounding Karen and Indy through the streets and tubes of London. Indy and Karen steal a car but crash into the London Bridge and are balanced precariously, trying not to tumble into the river below. All right, folks, we are back down here in the Temple of Longbox. And joining me for this episode is probably the guy who knows the most about Indiana Jones out of everybody that works at Longbox. It is our very own Delve in the Dark Web, Williams. Welcome to the Temple of Longbox, which, as you now know, is buried deep beneath regular Longbox Crusade headquarters. Yeah, I, I made the mistake of moving this lamp and I got some cardio in. There was this big ass ball chasing me. <laughs> he's got he's got Indiana Jones. I told you he was the expert. He's got references <laughs> for days. He's got references. He was either that or I was gonna be like, Mr. Jones, Mr. Jones. That's it. That's all I got. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So some of you have figured out by now, longtime listeners have known that Delvin's not steeped in Indiana Jones like the rest of us at LBC headquarters or the rest of humanity for that. For that. <laughs> I'm going to get my own joke out. Anyways, Delvin, I'm going to ask you the question that I've been asking people who come down here to the temple. How did you come to Indiana Jones? I know that you haven't really dipped into the movies, so I'm excited to hear how you first kind of found him. I listened to Indiana Jones uh, 1 that's uh, come out. Good show, by the way. And I was reminded that the first book that I did ever with Longbox Crusade was Indiana Jones. So I'd say that I have more experience with Indiana Jones comic books than the movies. The movies at this point, I would have to be not American to not know that Indiana Jones was a thing. Even so much so to the point where reading some of the issue, I was sitting there reading it, hearing Harrison... Ford's gruff voice, like saying it. So I know that like mine is a lot more, it's like memento almost. <laughs> like <laughs> I just have it etched into my memory. Like I can remember this little part from the movie. I can remember this part from the movie. I can remember reading a comic book or two. I know exactly who Indiana Jones is and usually the time frame that he's set in. So I would say that I could pass a very basic, I mean the basicest of trivia test when it came to Indiana Jones, but but that's about it. Very cool. I told you guys it was going to be different. (laughs) So, yeah, if my memory, and I'm going strictly off memory here, I want to say that that 
Further Adventures of Indiana Jones comic we covered on Longbox Crusade was number 17. Was it in this run? Yes. Nice. So this is back when we just pick random stuff from the long boxes for the show, which we kind of still do on the on the long box. I was wrong. It was 18. I just looked it up. It was 18. You were close, man. Didn't I mean. was close. So Delvin was like pretty much read Further Adventures of Indiana Jones 18 and four. <laughs> and we, we either did another one or did one for like Crusademus or something like well, that. Yeah, I think Pat brought one mm-hmm. of the Dark Horse. Dark Horse ended up buying mm-hmm. the license afterwards. Yep. I think we did a yep. Dark Horse Indiana Jones. Anyway, so now we've got the flavor for that. Delvin's uh, rounding out uh, the long box crew here as my first initial guest. And the guest list will just keep on getting more expansive and exciting. But Delvin's rounding it out with number four. And we're going to look at the cover, which I described earlier. For those of you listening, I'm sure you heard me give an excellent cover <laughs> description. It is by a pretty solid artist, Mr. Ron Friends. Mm-hmm. And Delvin, your thoughts? Ron Friends also did the inside of it. And as soon as I saw the name, I smiled. It was like uh, looking at name of an old friend uh, because one of my big expenditures back in the day as a teenager was the graphic novel of the saga of the alien symbiote and Amazing Spider-Man, which Ron Friends drew the majority of. Oh, and so, goodness. So I didn't I, remember that. I've always liked Ron's style. It's kind of like Sal Buscema, if you think about it. Very simple, very grounded, very clean, but very good. And it worked for Indiana Jones. You look at this cover, and you got Indy in a classic pose where he's just like right at the end of extending that whip holding off the bad guys. And you got like one of those bad guys that looks like his name is like Ugo or something like that because like one of his eyes is closed and he just looks like he has just been a whole bunch of different fights. Now you've got the other archaeologists with him. Not quite a damsel because she played a little bit of a role in it. But again, then again she's an archaeologist. It's not like she's used to fighting and swashbuckling <laughs> and stuff. And with the backdrop of a freaking subway train coming at them in the tube, if I'm not mistaken, of the uh, mm-hmm. underground in England. So, like, yeah, it's a good cover. Uh, it's a good cover. It's uh, definitely one where you're like, if that occurred in a book, something pretty action-y is happening. Yeah, this is pro- maybe the highest level of action cover we've had so far. It's a good one. Yeah, Ron Friends is a classic. I do get a kick out of, and I might have mentioned this in the last episode, or the next one, because I recorded these out of order. Anyway, I get a kick out of how they have the cover blurb on there featuring the hero of Raiders of the Lost Ark, which is an excellent reminder to everybody that back here in 1983, all we had was the one movie, which was called Raiders of the Lost Ark. Indiana Jones does not appear in the title. It becomes Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom, then Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade. But the first one was just called Raiders of the Lost Ark. So they're like trying to cover their base like, hey, hey, this is the guy <laughs> from that movie. Yeah. You liked. <laughs> and I always thought that was weird. I always thought they might have picked a different font for further adventures and gone more with the movie font. But I do like the font they picked. It's cool. It's clean. Yeah. You know, and I agree. Like if they did like that, the further adventures of like on top of it, like the Raiders font, that'd be kind of cool too. Yeah. Yeah. I think it would have helped with the recognition, but who knows? Who knows? All right. Opening it up, looking on the inside, there's plenty to talk about between the art and the story and the story beats. And so we'll just kind of do this in classic long box style and, and let you see what you're going to lead off with. You got high, low, what the, what are you thinking uh, on the interior story? Well, I mentioned Ron friends uh, being a uh, friend that's seen before. So was David Michelini. Um, uh-huh. so I'm just, yeah, I'm like, this wasn't is, he uh, the guy on the? Didn't he pencil or write a lot of the Clone Saga as well? Not the uh, Alien Symbiote Saga uh, that Friends was on. He he came in right around the time, and I, will, I won't forget this because he was writing Spider Man when I started collecting the book in the three forties. Oh. Okay. Michelini was on the book uh, for a little bit of Todd McFarlane. And for Eric Larson and right. a, and a very little bit of Mark Bagley. I uh, remember that. I, that's probably when I was in my deepest Spider-Man phase was at that time. So, yeah, I'm, yeah. I'm ashamed that I'd forgotten that. Yeah. Uh, so I saw, like, David Michelini, and I'm like, hey. So Michelini Friends is, yeah, like, you know, almost like a little spider reunion. So that alone is a high. And you know how it is when you, you know, you see a, a friend or whatever, and you're already – 
expecting a good time because, you know, this is a friend. This is someone you like. The exact same way here. Like, I, it put me in a good mood, and I'm like, okay, I am going to be able to trust this story. So the first high that I'll give is that, man, they threw a lot of, I, I, I understand it's Indiana Jones archaeology, but they threw a lot of facts at you. Like, mm -hmm. you can tell that Mr. Michelini did his homework for this issue. And almost to the point where it's like, do they make comic books like that anymore? Like, I feel like this was an educational <laughs> book, especially given the timepiece uh, that it was in, like late 1930s and everything. I thoroughly enjoyed the education that I got from the book. You only see that in books like this in Hamilton versus Burrow Werewolf Tale. But Ooh. anyway. <laughs> Uh, all right, so you've got a good how you're enjoying the the settings and the and the research that's put into it. Of course, we're loving Ron Friends. Just as a side note, wasn't he the guy that did like every issue of Spider Girl? He did a whole lot of Spider Girl. Was him um, and Lee Weeks? Was it the two of them? I know Pat Olive did some Spider Girl as well. And there, dude, there was a lot of Spider Girl. So I don't know if he drew like it was like more than a hundred issues of Spider Girl. Jeez. So Friends has been around, man. He's been around. And like I remember Friends first and foremost from the Fantastic Four. That was alliterative assault. Get out. <laughs> <laughs> Friends first and foremost from the Fantastic Four. I love it. <laughs> yeah, I remember seeing a lot. Of, and Thor. He drew uh, a lot of Thor as well. Okay, okay. Well, we've talked. We all, this almost always comes up how we've pretty much figured out that Marvel got the rights to Indiana Jones, but not necessarily the likeness to... Harrison Ford, with the exception of the actual movie adaptations. He looks exactly like Harrison Ford in those. And in these, he's a little looser. But I will say, I think this is the most Ford-looking of all the artists we've seen so far, which I know you don't have a barometer for, because you just came in at number four. But I thought his Indiana Jones was pretty good. Did you have any thoughts on, on how that was designed and how he looked throughout the book? It was Harrison-esque. Esque, you know? yes. <laughs> Like... It, to where it wasn't so distracting. Like, we've had that discussion uh, when we covered a few Star Wars on Crusader Chronicles slash Amazing Spider-Man Chronicles, where we would see Luke Skywalker, and it's like, that, that don't look like Luke Skywalker. That don't look like Mark Hamill. That's weird. It's, it, and it threw me off a little bit, but I was not thrown off at all. Uh, when it came uh, to how Friends drew uh, his Indiana Jones. It was almost like, Man, I, I throw a question back to you. Have you ever had to draw someone and they said that you couldn't draw this person you had to draw like 75%? Yes. of? How difficult is that? It's, it is hard because I when I got the sketch cards for the Marvel trading cards gig, they had some rules in them, you know, and it was like, hey, draw Iron Man, but don't draw him as Robert Downey Jr. So keep the helmet on, right? That's the, <laughs> that's the key. Yeah. It's just so tough. And and there was more than one light guideline like that. And of course, we've interviewed over on our James Bond channel, several Bond artists, Jason Masters, Ibrahim Mustafa, and they all say the same thing. You know, the Ian Fleming Foundation wants them to draw James Bond, but not to look like any of the actors. And like the more actors you get, like that's, the, that's like they're boxing you in slowly right. but surely. So I feel bad for those guys. But yes, I have had that in my professional career. And it's weird. It's like you just start thinking about ways to like with Iron Man, leave his helmet on or OK, if, if it's like a darker hero, like, say, the Punisher, you know, and they don't want him to look like Ray Stevenson. Then you go, OK, I'm going to put a bunch of shadow on his face or or I'll even go so far as to go online and just look at various male models. Just some mm. random male model dude who's got a face. Oh, he could be the Punisher. And then I'll use his face, his face. Yeah. <laughs> and then hope he doesn't sue me. <laughs> Very, very quick fact. You remember the very, very famous cover from Duran Duran's Rio? Mm -hmm. The person who drew that cover picked a supermodel or model mm -hmm. and sort of loosely based it, that cover, that very famous album cover off of this model. She didn't even know it until like decades later. <laughs> Crafty, clever, hidden. <laughs> so yeah, I, I think that's a good call, just picking like a model. But yeah, I'm pretty sure they got the Ron Friends as Harrison Ford is is close here, especially in certain panels where you're just like, I'm sure like Harrison was like reading this, like looking with a magnifying glass. <laughs> like, 
Hmm. <laughs> you know, I wonder if he's ever read these comics. I wonder if Harrison Ford has ever read these comics. I knowing, that. knowing Harrison Ford, no. no. <laughs> <laughs> I don't even know. I didn't even know they made a comic book. What's a comic book? <laughs> All right, well, getting back to the comic, it has several action beats. It's the first part of a two-parter. And spoiler alert, folks, you're going to get the second part next episode. That's not much of a spoiler. But the guest will be Jim the Joe Junkie. We'll talk about the second part. So the first part is a lot of setup of yep. this, as I mentioned in the story recap, of this crystal. And I think they're trying to get it to Stonehenge to see what it does. And yep. Yeah, yeah. And you know what? Who's involved? The Nazis. Big shocker there, right? And they're kind of chasing him. So you kind of got this cat and mouse. Very Indiana Jones, if you've seen any of the movies. Where am I going with this? There's a couple of fun action beats and chase beats. And I'm just kind of wondering, which one was your favorite? Ooh. I mean, the subway chase was very good. Basically, from the time they left the restaurant on. Because I, I'll consider that one long action beat. Yeah, well, because it was. <laughs> yeah, because he figured out that, like, through just the most luckiest means that basically that was not soup. It was acid that he was about to consume because there was a fly in it. And then from that point, the chase was on. They went through the subway. And I love that they tried to get into a taxi and, and the guy was like, like, hey, whatever. He's like, no, there's some Nazi chase. I was like, what? Nazis? Uh, say less, son. Let's go. <laughs> and, and the funniest part was when like the Nazis are running after and a dude opened the door <laughs> and the Nazi ran into the door and it's like, are, are you hurt? Bad? <laughs> yeah, I don't think that the general British population had any love for the Nazis in 1939 or 8 or whatever this was. <laughs> so that, that'd be my favorite. It just it, uh, it was a great chase. Like I can imagine this comic book being adapted into a movie. Mm-hmm. Like the first, even though I didn't pick it, the first scene was good of yeah. where, you know, he's like, you know, hey, Smitty, whatever. And it's like, it's not Smitty, it's Schmidt. And locked him in and just jumps out of the plane and, and Indy has to figure out a way. I was a little bit iffy on whether or not he could have survived hitting the water from that far up. <laughs> they they tried to explain it. And I was like, hey. it's very funny because every time I read one of these issues, there's something in it that makes me feel like it's a quote unquote callback to an Indiana Jones movie moment that hasn't happened yet because mm-hmm. Temple of Doom hasn't happened yet. And he and Willie and Short Round get stuck in a plane with no pilot and they leap out with the use of a life raft as a quasi parachute. And in mm-hmm. this one, he has to leap out with, I think they're like Red Cross blankets as a quasi parachute yep. to slow him down enough to where he doesn't die when he hits the water. And both of those moments are like only in <laughs> Indiana Jones world, right? But it's so yeah. weird that this comes out before that. And there has been something like literally every issue that happens pretty closely in an Indiana Jones movie that hasn't come out yet. <laughs> so so that's somebody, weird. somebody was reading the comic books. I think so. I think so. I think Steven Spielberg was like, mm-hmm, make a note of this, make a note of this. <laughs> well, this one ends with a kind of literal cliffhanger. They've stolen some yeah. rich dudes like Bentley or something like that. Really nice car. Might have been a Rolls Royce. Hits a bridge. He's They're dangling off. The Germans are coming up from behind him who knows what's going to happen i know that uh we've become fond of cliffhangers thanks to our coverage of various serials on saturday matinee theater did you have any thoughts on the cliffhanger thought it was a good one i thought it was a plausible one too of where you're like oh crap i forgot i'm in a foreign country who drives on the wrong side of the road that can throw you i have driven when i was on ascension island ascension island they follow the queen's rules now the king's rules and you drive on the left side of the road. You do not drive on the right. And it, I almost, when I, at one point, left Ascension to come back to the States for something or the other. And that first turn out, I was in some rental car. And that first turn out, I was like, right side, right side. <laughs> I can't imagine trying to change the lifetime of driving habits. I totally bought into that. I really did. And then, like, you know, they're like, oh, okay, we're okay of the bumper holds. And it was like, yeah, for six seconds. <laughs> And <laughs> so yeah, I, I thought it was I thought it was a very good cliffhanger to where I'm interested in seeing how Bond's gonna get out of it. Uh, Bond. <laughs> Might as well. <laughs> <laughs> I'm interested in seeing how Indiana gets out of it. I do like that they play him as being 
very, very resourceful, like a MacGyver type character that never say die of what do I have around me to get me out of this situation? It is not impossible. It's just implausible. So that means that I could find a way out of it. I, I appreciated that greatly. He found a way to escape that plane. He found a way to escape a freaking fast moving subway train coming at him. It found a way to escape being poisoned by, you know, the soup. And then, so he's going to find some inventive way to get out of this to save uh, the life of him and uh, his uh, female compatriot as well. So I appreciate that with Indiana. You know, it's funny that you kind of had a, the slip and mentioned James Bond because he's come up a couple of times in these recordings. And we've often mentioned how they're very close in some ways. But one of the ways that they're not close, I've always found, is that Indy, like he's resourceful and he'll find a way, but he'll like he'll whip in, in an earlier issue. He, he swung down. to He's like, I think I can make this angle. And he kind of makes it. He smashes into a cart and he falls in the street. He's like, OK, I made it. He gets up and runs. Knowing that James Bond would have like slid right onto his feet, fixed his cuffs, yeah. and walk. like yeah. he, he's Bond without that smooth. Like when Bond was falling in living daylight, and his parachute was on fire, and he lands on a boat with a sexy woman on it. Right? <laughs> and he's got to use a, a blanket, and he takes a dip in the drink. And he's lucky a ship comes by with no yeah. ladies on it. <laughs> yeah, there's your difference. Plus, as we learned, Sean Connery will be. Indiana Jones's father. So it all it all ties together. It's all Sharkiller. It's all Sharkiller. That's right. Even though I think they're 13 years apart. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, anything else on this book before we look at the uh, ad and then call it a day? I enjoyed it. Won't say I had reservations coming in, but I was just like, I don't know. What am I getting into? What do I expect? Read it. I've already mentioned it, but I was into it as soon as I saw Michelinie and Friends. I'm like, okay, cool. I, I know these dudes can draw. And it also put me at ease that even though this is a movie property, that Marvel took it seriously and put talent behind it. And that right there says that, okay, we did care about the property. And that gave me reason enough to care about it, just being someone picking this book up 40 years later. Interesting you mentioned that because they are putting talent on it, but in short doses. And I think that kind of makes sense because I think all their talent, of course, is working on other books. And like I need mm -hmm. you because like the first two issues were John Byrne. And then issue three was a Denny O'Neill story. And then four and five is Friends and Michelinie. Six is Howard Chaikin. It's like they just keep boop, 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 like yep. all these names that we recognize, though. Yep. And that's interesting. Yep. Mm -hmm. So you didn't see this one coming. It's kind of a curveball question, but it's appropriate for having you on the show. You don't have hardly any background with the movies at all. I mean, you've admitted like your movie exposure is kind of like it was playing in the background when I was doing something. Yeah. Your comic book further adventures is really just this in 18 and then a dark horse one. How would you describe the further adventures of Indiana Jones as someone who's never read one? You've read two issues. How would you describe this book? I'd say it is a nerdy Tomb Raider. <laughs> they are they are often compared because I know a little bit about Tomb Raider, uh, and I think that you know they intentionally set you know at a time area of where you know he had a ready made bad guys and the Nazis, but ultimately it's just about a very smart, uh, resourceful man who finds himself in a bunch of adventures. But I like that there's that little nerdy aspect of it. He is an archaeologist. At one point, they had to just sit there for a few days and decipher some indecipherable code. And that was a necessary component to the book that led them to say, OK, we need to get this crystal at Stonehenge at this time in order to figure out what secrets were being revealed to us. That in itself is pretty fascinating. So, yeah, that's what I'll explain it as. So it's, you know, swashbuckling, nerdy tomb raider <laughs> i like that i like that i think that's good i love how in movies and comics every time they do that little like we got to decipher this foreign language and they spend days born over it and they go oh, that's tomorrow it's always tomorrow <laughs> or like like in transformers <laughs> we're doing the uh under base it's gonna be here next week <laughs> of course it is <laughs> could you imagine though know, like yeah it's gonna come in like you know 17 years three months four days <laughs> At several issues of just you know, <laughs> teaching well, classes yeah. in school. <laughs> All right. Well, I think that was a real good 
recap for a question that you didn't see coming. So I appreciate that. We're going to wrap it up talking about an ad. Delvin and I talked before recording. There's not a ton of ads in this book. Um, most of them are like the, sort of those flea markety ads with a bunch of different little things. But the inside front cover has a classic 80s ad. It's the one where Scotty, the number 15 baseball player, hits the home run to win the playoffs. And it's all about Cracker Jack, the snack Cracker Jack. What do you call a kid who can die like that? You call that kid a Cracker Jack. What do you call a kid who gives the ball a whack? You call that kid a cracker jack. What do you call a snack with a secret toy surprise in the back? Peanuts and popcorn that make your lips smack. It's caramel coated cracker jack. When you're really good, they call you cracker jack. Some of you listening are like, I can see that in my head right now. And Delvin and I can probably taste Cracker Jack right now. I can taste it. Did you eat a lot of Cracker Jack as a kid? No. <gasps> you you should gasp. I don't know what it was, Jared. I saw it. thought it was gross. I thought it looked gross. And so I didn't try it. Looking back, I was the exact same way like, well, with most fruit. For whatever reason, as a young kid, I remember just not liking the texture. And so I said, fruit's nasty. And I didn't eat it. Didn't want to eat it. Oh, I guess same thing with Cracker Jack. I looked at it, I was like, this is gross looking popcorn. I don't want it. And then looking back, I'm like, it's toffee <laughs> and popcorn. That is a delicious idea. <laughs> what the hell was I thinking? Because whenever I did try it, I'm like, this is a G damn delight. <laughs> like, what, what did I miss out on? Like, I, I wish I would have had more of it. Kid. It's a fantastic snack. I definitely had my fair share of boxes of Cracker Jack as a kid. It might contribute to my type 2 diabetes. But I, as a kid, it was all about every box comes with a toy surprise inside. Yeah. yeah. It was funny how like the toy got a little bit lighter and leaner as time went on. You could tell they were trying to save money. I I think they still do Cracker Jacks. I think they still come with like a sticker or something. The best ones when I was a kid was you always wanted. And I think most times what it was was like a little tattoo, one of those little temporary tats that you would put on. Oh man, we love the temporary tats from Cracker Jack. <sighs> well, just real quick, you know, a little t- a little, little friendly tip from the dark web. <laughs> Yes, Cracker Jacks is still being produced. Manufactured by Frito-Lay, a subsidiary of PepsiCo, Cracker Jack continue to be available in various sizes, including the iconic individual boxes often associated with vendors walking through the crowd at baseball games. There you go. I was just wondering. I was like, I don't know if I've seen one in a box in forever. I've seen them like bagged now, but good to know that the boxes are still out there. Heck yeah. So y'all get yourself a box of Cracker Jack, sit down with the Further Adventures of Indiana Jones, eat the Cracker Jack with the left hand, turn the page with the right hand, you're going to have Correct. Yeah, some, <laughs> some problems. Throw hands on your comic book. Ugh, no. Some manners. Right? Ugh. Well, that is it for the Further Adventures of Indiana Jones number four. I want to thank, I want to thank Delvin the Dark Web Williams for joining me on this episode down here in the Temple of Longbox. Delvin... Where can people find you out there on the internet? You can find me on Twitter, X, D-E-E underscore R-A-Y-1977. You can find me on Instagram, Delvin Ray. What about you? Well, Delvin, I'm glad you asked. You can find me at Yard Sale Artists on X, Facebook, and Instagram. It's all at Yard Sale Artists. You can check out my artwares at www.theyardsaleartist.com. And, of course, we'd love for you to check out the Longbox Crusade in all its locations. We are at Longbox Crusade on X, Facebook, Instagram, YouTube. You name it, you can probably find us out there at Longbox Crusade. Of course, you can call and leave a voicemail, 707-532-5269, 707-532-LBOX. We'd love to hear from you. And this is one of our shorter shows, so I will just say thank you to all the Patreon members out there. Our Crusaders Club members are the best, and they keep this stuff going. Thank you so much. I look forward to reading your names on a longer episode in the near future. With that, thanks for joining us again down here in the Temple of Longbox, and we will see you soon. We named the dog Indiana. The dog? <laughs> you are named after the dog? <laughs> Got a lot of fond memories of that dog. Did you find Junior? Junior?
Please.